it's a misdiagnosis situation and i have been sharing quite a few of these on my channel recently because i think we learn from the experiences of other people sad they may be sad though they may be um at least we hear the stories and perhaps it can put a check as we go on our own health journey um, and help us to push deeper advocate better ask more questions so i'm going to share my screen and um, while we look at this um, story, which I picked up from the Independent earlier today, um, and I'm just going to read through it. It's not that long, I suppose, but I just want us to read through it together. Hang on a second while I find my place. Um, and then we will just sort of have a discussion, maybe just raise one or two points that I thought were interesting to, to share with you guys. So let me share the screen. I hope, let me just check that it's visible. Here we go. Okay. So this is a story. Um, let me read from the main page. Yeah. So this is a story. It says, I developed ovarian cancer after my symptoms were dismissed as menopause. So of course, my ears were pricked. I was like, ah, how did we get from ovarian cancer and menopause? What's the connection? Um, so I don't know how recently this was published, but as you can see, it's from the independent. Let me just mute this. Yeah. It's from the independent paper. Um, so let's read the story. So a woman has said her ovarian cancer diagnosis was delayed after her symptoms were wrongly dismissed as menopause or irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, accusing her doctor of misogyny and medically gaslighting her. My goodness, my, my goodness, my, my goodness. Those are very, ha, huh, those are heavy accusations and this is so disappointing. This is so disappointing and um, sadly, sadly, remember if you were there when we were talking about, we did, I did a live stream on the endometriosis. I can't remember the title, but if you check the endometriosis playlist or even the um, advocating for ourselves, I think I have an advocating for ourselves playlist. It will be on one of those. And we talked about some of the experiences of women when it comes to these things, how they feel dismissed. When I say they, how we feel dismissed, how... There is some kind of gaslighting. You're, you don't feel as if you're being heard, listened to and heard um, in the sense that somebody hears the words that you're saying and applies them to your context in, able, in order to be able to help you make a decision that will help take you forward. That is effective listening, isn't it? That somebody is picking up what you're saying, even what you're not saying. So your nonverbal cues and then putting that information together and being empathetic with your situation so that you can move forward. Uh, women there was a there was a survey um it's on endometriosis uk um association website if i remember i'll put the link because it really makes for interesting reading women are not imagining things this is experience so these are heavy heavy accusations and i'm so, so, so sorry that somebody would experience this um in her quest for medical health she just wants to be healthy she wants to be healthy so um, we learn her name, but I don't know if this is a typo. I thought it might be Saba. I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Please, anybody who knows, correct me. But um, let's say she's Saba or Mr. Dick. A 55-year-old business owner told the Independent that unconscious bias and cultural incompetence were also to blame for her delayed diagnosis. So this is really, really important, this issue of cultural competence amongst healthcare professionals and being able to acknowledge that you can't treat everyone the same way. We all come from different backgrounds, a diverse plethora of experiences, cultures, and the way you speak to one person to, to be able to get them comfortable in the consulting room um, is different, has to be different. You have to appreciate that you know, people's health seeking behaviors are different. How they interpret information is different. It's, it's, it's different. It's different. And um, it looks like this wasn't respected in, in the case of Miss Sadiq. Okay, so let's go on. It says um, she lives in Berkshire. There's a picture of her down below, but let's read. Let's read on. Uh, she, lives in, she lives in Berkshire, said she began to feel unwell. So let's pick up her symptoms, okay? And this is recent. This is not something that happened 10 years ago. This is she began to feel unwell around October 2021, but did not get diagnosed with late stage ovarian cancer until March the following year. So her symptoms started October 2021, but the diagnosis didn't come until March the following year. And at that point, it was already late stage. So she had October, November, December, three, six months, really, um, the following year. 
she says i was feeling really tired all the time so symptom let's listen to the symptom tired all the time i had no energy so tired lack of energy piling on weights that wasn't there previously despite not changing my eating habits i was needing to wee more you see um ovarian cancer is not is not we really have to put on our awareness hats and be very suspicious, quickly suspicious for ovarian cancer when a woman comes in. And the reason I say that is because, you know, with that location in the abdomen, there are other conditions that may deceive us as clinicians and we don't pick it up unless you're sort of thinking about it quickly and, you know, putting it into the mix of possibilities. Um, I mean, if you look at the symptoms, tiredness, lack of energy can happen in menopause. Adding weight that wasn't there previously, despite not eating more, can happen in men menopause. Women add weight, can add weight in menopause. Um, going to be more, mm, there is the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which just means that as a result of something that we're going to talk about in a few minutes on this stream, um, changes to the, the, the genital area, changes to the tissue and um, because of the reduction in estrogen and progesterone can affect even a woman's urinary um, urinary symptoms. So she might be going to urinate frequently, experience frequent urinary infections. This is related to the reduction in hormones. So it can happen in menopause. So I can see where the symptoms initially may have been considered given her age and so on. I think the problem I have with, with is what she said at the beginning, where she felt she was not treated right, not listened to, medically gaslighted, and so on. I think that's part of the you know the concerns I have. But you can see where the symptoms could fit in with menopause, could fit in with IBS, could even fit in with ovarian cancer as well, which there are no exact specific symptoms. It can be vague symptoms, but you really have to put on your, your thinking cap and feel you cannot let this woman go you know, without excluding ovarian cancer. So that will prompt you to do the necessary blood test and request for the scan to have a look at what's going on. So um, those are her symptoms. So next she says, I was going back and forth with my GP trying to get an appointment. So of course this was during COVID as well, 20, October, 2021. I couldn't get a face-to-face. -face. Every consultation was on the phone of her online forms. That was part of the problem of the misdiagnosis. And she goes on to say her GP was very dismissive of her symptoms and attributed them to IBS or the menopause. At the end of the day, I'm not the expert. The GP is, I believed him. So it says, Ms. Sadiq, co-founder of Asian Star Radio, said she accepted his diagnosis until a routine in-person appointment with her dermatologist who sensed something was wrong. So finally, a clinician saw her. And, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm an advocate and I support online consultations. I know that they have a place in um, current medical practice, but not in every instance. And I think if somebody has talked about a set of symptoms once, twice and she's not getting better then you should be saying okay i think it's time to just have a look at you or take a closer look at things um obviously we don't have all the information here please this is we're just sort of putting our thinking caps on in fact in fact i forgot to use my disclaimer so let me just put the disclaimer on while we're here it's a bit late and i apologize but it's always important that one we don't have all the information to hand that's number one and number two of course we don't um we're not trying to diagnose anyone. We're just providing information and education. Really important to bear that in mind. Um, so, and hello, Waneka, where is this now? Neka Nebedun, Waneka Nebedun. Nice to see you. Hi there. Where are you writing from? Is this, is this YouTube it is? Hi, where are you um, watching from? How are you doing? How's your day going? Hope you've had a good weekend. Thank you for joining the stream. So, um, let us carry on with this lady's story so um yeah she accepted the diagnosis until a routine in-person appointment so she saw her dermatologist who sensed something was wrong how did the dermatologist sense something was wrong hmm. and so this is a photograph of mr dick uh in hospital so she's had some procedures ah <sighs> right it could be any any one of us Okay, so the dermatologist says, are you okay? Your tummy doesn't look right. Huh? That's it. So, you know, I'd love more information about this because uh, anyway, so it depends on what she was in the dermatologist for, what skin conditions that she was in the dermatologist for that necessitated them to have a look at their tummy. Um, so she says, my tummy looked like I was six months pregnant at age 54. Hmm. 
I wonder what would have happened if I hadn't seen my dermatologist. I would have believed what my GP was saying. It would have got worse. I would have probably gone in by AID admission. She's not wrong there. She is not wrong. So it says, Mr. Dick went on to be diagnosed with stage 3 cancer. The stage of the disease, she explained, that comes just before stage 4, which is often terminal. That is true. Stage 3 is late. And she adds, or she added, as women of color, we are unintentionally disadvantaged. It is a system that is just not designed for someone like me, for a middle-aged woman of color. Oh, that, that, that. It doesn't that make you sad to read that? Doesn't that just make you sad? There are unconscious biases at play. The system isn't designed for diverse patients. So we have to keep on picking this. We have to keep on picking. This is not one individual. It's a system that doesn't recognize, uh, that doesn't, that's not designed for someone, for a middle-aged woman of color that is not culturally competent, doesn't recognize the differences and um, not just recognizing differences, actually being respectful enough to a, to a person or to, to people to understand and listen to their issues and help them forward, like I explained at the beginning. So she says there was unconscious bias, cultural incompetence, medical gaslighting to some extent. It was easier to fob me off and dismiss me as menopausal, as a menopausal woman making a fuss. We have to be careful, us clinicians, doctors, nurses, we have to be careful of those patients that we say are making a fuss. Um, because maybe they're making a fuss because there's really something serious going on and we need to listen. And it's... um. It's, it is, it's tricky. It's tricky. But listening to somebody and just trying to understand where they're coming from without making that judgment. Um, I think many people would just like to be going on up, doing their own thing and going about their day and not coming to sit down with the doctor making a fuss. So it is worthwhile listening. And what exactly is she worried about? What's going on? Mr. Dick said it is likely she would have avoided invasive treatment that has now left her with permanent disabilities if her cancer diagnosis had not been delayed. I had IV chemo, four rounds through a cannula on the arm, which is probably what she was doing that on that photo that we saw. I did that for 12 weeks. One of the side effects is peripheral neuropathy from damaged nerve endings in the hands and feet. Yes, so that's damaged nerves in your hands and feet. And she says, because of that, I have a lot of pain when walking and sitting. I can't sit on the floor any longer. I can't walk long distances. I can no longer wear high heels. I was extremely active prior to my diagnosis. So these are the um, the huge burden um, of cancer diagnosis and treatment. Often, often easier when things are picked up very early before they've allowed to spread and you have a better fighting chance of treatment that helps to manage the condition, puts you into remission um, and you can sort of go on to have a fairly normal life. Um, after early stage treatment, but by the time it's spread, then the the chances of recovery, the chances of experiencing um, severe side effects, all those things are much, much higher. Um, the IV chemo also caused debilitating fatigue, nausea, vomiting, constipation, and hair loss. She explained how oral, so when she switched on to tablets, chemotherapy tablets, she developed a rash and that she still suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of that. So the rash started on my face, it looked like teenage acne. Then it literally spread to my chest and then to my whole body. By this time it had mutated and its appearance had changed. I was on that medication for seven weeks, that's the um, chemotherapy tablets, and was hospitalized four times. Any doctor said the rash was what an acid burn victim would look like. This, the rash was dry, flaky, red, run, itchy. I would stand up and there would be a puddle of skin. It's like Stevens Johnson's kind of thing that she's describing here. That's a severe life-threatening, potentially life-threatening, you know, skin problem. And it can develop as a side effect of medication. Anyway, I don't know. Like I said, we don't have, the all we have is what she's telling us here. Um, but she was on this very, she had this very, very serious complication. Ah. Uh, she explained side effects from the rash caused her to pass out from exhaustion, adding that she was broken physically and mentally. What a shame. What a shame. It is now just over a year since Miss Sadiq was told she was wholly cancer-free, something she describes as a miracle and attributes to her Muslim faith, keeping her grounded as well as the support of, love of her loved ones. Wonderful. Thank goodness for her. There is no doubt the NHS needs more funding. She concluded this needs to be sustained and not a sticking plaster, but a long-term policy around cancer care. 
but there also needs to be systemic change to account for patients cultural and religious religious nuances this is what we're saying about cultural competence you know your body best you know what your normal is and if something doesn't feel right then go and get it checked so advocate for yourself please speak up mm. please speak up be persistent if you're not getting the answer you need go with somebody to talk to the doctors look for a second third or whatever opinion is needed if you still feel it's not being taken seriously Janet Lindsay, Chief Executive of Women's Health Charity, Wellbeing of Women, warned ovarian cancer is often diagnosed at the late stages when treatments can be less effective. Because it's one of those horrible cancers. I mean, they're all horrible, aren't they? But you know, there, there's no specific, there's no specific early stage symptom that you know sort of shouts out that, oh, this is probably what this is. So you have to really be looking for it, be conscious and be looking for it. And sometimes the symptoms may mimic other less serious conditions. It's not an excuse, just an explanation, and we should do better. We should work at trying to get better at this. We know that those from ethnic minority backgrounds in the UK require more visits to the GP, have to wait longer for diagnosis, and are often diagnosed with later stage cancers. Ah, God have mercy. We know that those from ethnic minority backgrounds in the UK require more visits to the GP. What, what, what is it that they're not speaking? What are the problems? This is where we need to focus our interest. Have to wait longer for diagnosis, often diagnosed with later stage cancers. So this is it. This is this is do we have data supporting that? <clears throat> so Miss Lindsay, whose organization has launched a fundraising campaign for research into the treatment and diagnosis of gynecological cancers, said every year 7,500 women are diagnosed with ovarian cancer in the UK. Around 4,100 die of the disease, which is 11 women each day. There's an urgent need to improve survival. Yeah, we, we need to get better at this, picking it up earlier. Dr. Victoria Zotsu Brown, Vice Chair of the Royal College of GPs, said, We want all women, regardless of their background or circumstances, to feel comfortable approaching their GP if they're experiencing any painful or worrying symptoms. And we are always concerned to hear reports of patients not feeling this has been the case. We can't comment on specific cases as we don't have all the details, but the GPs aim to do the best for their patients. We are highly trained and experienced in having open, confidential and honest conversations, working with our patients to come up with the most appropriate treatment plan based on their unique health needs. However, we currently have a severe shortage of, shortage of GPs and it's becoming increasingly difficult to give patients the time and safe care they deserve, which is why we are encouraged by the new government's pledge of more funding and support for the family doctor service. So this is the story of Mr. Deek um, and how, her, how she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer later than she should have been. Um, and because she thinks that her symptoms were not listened to in a timely fashion, and she thinks it has something to do with her race or her culture. Let me stop sharing. Um, so there's so many lessons to pick up from there. The principal thing I really wanted us to wanted to address was this thing called safety netting. Let me just leave this to play. So you can see the net over there. And the reason I wanted to share that, it's a net, and I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but it's a, a net over water. I think it's on a ship or a boat or something on a ship, I suppose. <laughs> and um, one of the things that your GP will do when you come for a consultation um, and we're looking at a potential diagnosis, especially when it's not clear, we will give you some safety netting advice. And it's usually information that the GP will give you. Um, it might be related, it might be time bound. It might They might say, you know, let's do X, Y, Z. And if you're not getting better by a week, then do this. Or it may be, let's do X, Y, Z. I think this is what's going on. Um, and if things start to get worse, for example, if this happens or that happens or that happens, then I'd like you to do this. So it's called safety netting in the sense that, you know, the doctor has sat down, listened to you, gone through the history and done an examination and is thinking of a possible, a list of possible things it could be. They would consider, well, this is probably the most likely. They start you on that treatment. They haven't done any tests to say that they are, they, they, they've confirmed that this is what they're treating you for. And then they provide a safety net. And this is what I worry in this story that we've just listened to. I worry that there wasn't a safety net. I mean, there clearly wasn't 
a an effective examination to help to identify there was the assumption time after time after time when things were not getting better so that's the problem things were not getting better and then they stop to just that diagnosis. When things aren't getting better, then we have to start asking ourselves, well, could something else be going on? And then until you've exhausted all the possible tests to establish that, oh, nothing else is going on. Before doing that, really, you can't say that you have fully uh, addressed the um, person's concerns. So um, yeah, that was a really, oh, that's a really poor story. But the reason I bring up this misdiagnosis cases that I share them and I think they're useful for us to pay attention to um, is for learning so that we can you know think what that could have been me and um, what could she have done differently so you can sort of play that in your mind and help let that help you make your advocacy whether it's for yourself or for a friend or a member of your family or